It says that's cool. It's staring on into infinity right there. Yeah. Yeah. We are starting our presentations today. So uh, I'm going to minimize this. And I believe I'd like to start with data analytics. So group three, you are up first. Uh, our group is doing the use of data analytics and auditing and assurance. I'm Madeline. I'm Austin. I'm Chad. I'm Grant. I'm Jillian. Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you already know what data analytics is, but it's the process of collecting, uh, transforming, and organizing data in order to draw conclusions or make predictions. Uh, data analytics is a multidisciplinary field, which is very versatile in many aspects of life. There are four different types of data analytics, which include descriptive, which is what happened. Um, if you're looking at an issue, what exactly occurred? The second type is diagnostics, which is why something occurred. Um, so if you have an issue, you're looking at why exactly it went, it happened. Predictive, which is what is likely to happen. Um, and prescriptive, which is how to fix whatever happened. So if you have an issue, obviously you don't want that to be ongoing. Uh, so you're looking at that specifically to fix that issue. Um, this is also included within the data analytics process. Uh, first step is identifying your question. The second is collecting your uh, raw data. The third step is cleaning your data. Fourth step is analyzing your data. And then the fifth step is interpreting your results. Uh, like I mentioned before, it's very versatile. People use it every day. Specifically, the sales industry uses it um, mainly in terms of like seeing if a design is worth keeping around the company, if it's you know starting to produce less revenue than you want to. Um, obviously, maybe let go of that design and move on to something else. And then also the healthcare industry uses it um, specifically for like inventory purposes and prescriptions. Uh, up here also, the data analytics is used in mechanical processes and algorithms. This kind of goes along with um, automated financial reporting. Uh, they use it to generate key performance indicators, which is often obviously used to see how well your company is doing. And then uh, fraud detection systems as well, which we've talked a lot about. Um, if you have any issues, obviously you wanna get those solved. And then data analytics also relies a lot on software tools. So data vis visualization, spreadsheets, open source learning or open source languages and reporting tools. I'm going to be going over the background of data analytics. Traditionally, data analytics was uh, traditionally data analytics. Uh, they involve manual sampling and testing. This uh, was prone to a lot of oversight. It was also very time consuming. It required a very small data set. And when you're testing a subset of the data set, it's hard to keep doing traditional whenever your company grows larger. Your data set is also going to grow larger with it. This led to the emergence of data analytics tools. Data analytics tools not only test a single transaction much faster than a human can, it, uh, it tests the entire data set. This meant that we weren't only reliant on descriptive statistics, but we were now able to indulge in prescriptive and predictive analytics. The purpose for data analytics uh, came from uh, companies growing larger, not only nationally, but they also began to spread across the globe. This meant that the complexity of your data sets grew drastically, whether it was from foreign transactions or because of foreign policies. This, this uh, meant that the traditional way of auditing became completely inadequate. This was proved by scandals such as Enron and WorldCom. And it was then, uh, and because of Enron WorldCom, there was a pressure for efficiency and fraud detection. This was then uh, amplified, and because because of them, it led to the PCAOB and the SEC requiring data analytics and regular audits. The most basic data analytic tool is going to be Excel. 
However, most audits require more advanced tools such as IDEA or ACL. These tools can help with reducing repetition and uncover hidden uh, patterns that would be hard to detect otherwise. It also helps with data visualization, statistical testing, and machine learning for anomaly detection. The main sectors that led to the adoption in data analytics were banking, healthcare, and retail. All of these are very important because they are very intensive, uh, very data intensive operations. They benefit from the enhanced insight and enhanced efficiency that the data analytics tools provided. The problem with implementing these tools is that they require a lot of training and they're hard to integrate in some existing frameworks. Okay, so I'm gonna be going over more of the current status of the use of data analytics and auditing insurance. So with the increased use of data analytics and auditing, it's creating a greater competitive advantage for companies. So they're allocating more time, resources, and just more efforts into helping develop them. And it was found that generally big four firms tend to use data analytics more than non-big four firms. And this could be for a number of reasons. Um, they have more resources available, they have more advanced technology, or they just have more complex clients that require the use of data analytics. And then with that, since the data analytics has become more um, prevalent in auditing, organizations are looking for employees with more experience, skills, and knowledge in the area. And then AI and machine learning are becoming integrated into the auditing process to detect patterns, trends, and do more mundane tasks that would otherwise take a long time. Another way auditors are just using technology to assist in the um, use of data analytics. And then data analytics is helping to improve predictive analysis and visualization tools in the audits. So it helps models predict potential issues and areas for improvement based on past audits and then transforming complex data into more useful data um, and they can pull from some of their decision-making. So how they're used in audit tasks a little bit more specifically. So risk assessment and audit planning by both big four firms and non-big four firms use data analytics the most. Following that, calculating sample size, it was used second most. Um, it allows auditors to use more advanced tools um, to be, and it's become significantly e easier to calculate sample size. And then data extraction and auditing is additionally used by all firm sizes. Um, it provides organizations with easy to use tools and clear data to pull from. Following that, cleaning the data um, was used fairly often in auditing since it's a more tedious and time consuming task. It otherwise takes a long time to do this. And then last data analytics is used often during substantive testing because it provides auditors with more flexibility to test what they're trying to develop. And then with the use of data analytics, um, there's been more of a shift into real time auditing. So Auditors have been able to conduct ongoing and real life monitoring of transactions, which overall helps um, prevent fraud and detect er errors much faster, which overall just increases the timeliness of audits. And then with that, um, automate, or automated data collection allows for the extraction and integration of data from multiple sources at once rather than just one at a time. And then data analytics in the end has overall provided auditors with the ability to provide customers with more timely, accurate, and comprehensive audits that they otherwise would not be able to do. Running over some of the future considerations we have. So these are basically like the core methods that I found that people are using and they're getting some items in the chart and they're just getting better and people are using more as we move into more intensive data analysis. So we have risk assessment, which is basically now that we're not sampling everything, we can take everything as a whole and get kind of like a more conclusive answer. Continuous auditing, as mentioned, we're just detecting fraud simpler. Audit quality, we enhance that detail, we get more reliability of the evidence from the professional judgment. So everything that goes into what we say about the audit, what opinion we give, all that evidence is gonna be a lot more reliable, it's gonna be a lot more detailed. Skill development, as we get more data analytics, in auditing, we're going to see people are going to need to take a training course of some sort. They're going to need to interpret and be able to present this information uh, more efficiency. As we know, we automate a lot of tasks and we're going to be automating a lot more tasks. But as we do, we need to figure out when we need to stop and what professional judgment needs to take over. In this chart, we have like a few of the tools that they use. 
So that'll be automated machine learning, which basically we all know we should be pretty used to it by now. Blockchain analytics, which will basically, I've seen that it's mostly used in like private companies looking at cryptocurrency right now. And then the graph analytics, which we've all seen. Continuous intelligence, which basically is kind of like continuous auditing, but it's keeping track of one simple thing. And then you can ask questions to it and it'll give you like evidence of what it's doing and why it's doing that action. We have uh, explainable AI, which is another form of artificial intelligence, which also explains actions and opinions that AI can give. We have augmented analytics, which will also provide insight from any sort of continuous auditing that you can do. Augmented data management, which will automate any tasks that involves like management data, which could be anything from like quality assessment, quality control, stuff like that. And then data fabric design, which basically will support the data transformation process by keeping everything accessible and reliable in that data. Two more main foundations of future considerations. We need to look at client insight. As we get more automation and data, we can do things faster, we get more information. The clients are gonna be able to understand what we're saying clearer. We can use these graphs, we can use this AI to help explain it to a different level and get our clients making the right decisions about their controls and their management. The cybersecurity will need to increase as the inflow of all the data analytics. We're using very sensitive information throughout all these audits. So cybersecurity is gonna be a big deal and risk factors will increase. This chart basically just shows what processes we could be using analytics for and how much it is and how much of an inflow of sensitive data this would be. Sorry, let me wait a second. So going into the conclusion of data analytics, uh, particularly in the use of auditing and uh, looking at uh, entities and companies that uh, use this data analytics to be able to provide insights, uh, auditors are able to provide insights directly to management, share owners, uh, share or stock owners. The ability to kind of see how is a company working, how is it doing, uh, obviously auditors would have to apply more abilities to understanding how a company is doing because seeing the raw data and just numbers isn't going to be uh, acceptable to be able to understand uh, materiality and understanding if the company is doing good. Obviously, uh, this provides the ability for entities and management to uh, apply new abilities to understand what they could do better, what they could change for the data that they see. Uh, for example, if a company is a asset uh, entity or based on investments, uh, you would obviously use different data analytical tools for that. And in that type of aspect of utilizing tools, we kind of used one for uh, our Excel assignment. We were looking at uh, the trend over time for two different companies. Uh, I know that might not be as extensive as other data, data analytic tools, but it, it was a smaller kind of offshoot of that. And overall, uh, being able to use data analytics helps auditors themselves uh, be able to organize information. Otherwise, they would struggle with organizing because uh, it's a large amount and uh, following entities that might have uh, transactions in the billions at the end of the year uh, can be very troublesome for some auditors. So having that analytical tool can provide a lot more context for entities as well as provide more context for auditors to give to share owners to be able to understand what they're investing into and how is that working. As well as to reiterate a lot of the points that my other colleagues have provided, it provides a field that isn't only just beneficial for auditors, not for just uh, accounting or finance majors, but it's also applicable to uh, businesses overall, as well as other data scientists who are able to implement these tools. So, and continuing, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, if we have any questions, please ask. Oh, that was a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, several years ago, when I first started out as a professor at the, at the State, 
I attended this conference and the tagline of the conference was accounting is big data. Based on what you all have done your research with data and what it's, do you agree with that statement or you disagree with it? And what, what, what would be your reason behind it? I think that that would be true. I mean, a lot of the times you see, especially as we get into these very extensive data analytics, we're using the full data sets. It's huge data, we're automating it now, so we can kind of get it into a smaller understandable sense. But as a form of big data, it's mostly gonna be this huge thing, all these transactions automated down to what we need to look at. So one of the things that I was working on when I worked with KPMG, and this is where I get to tell my tales of olden day accounting, but uh, I actually worked on a program called CACM, which was Continuous Auditing, Continuous Monitoring. And uh, you touched upon that. How do you think continuous auditing is different now than it would have been, you know, 20 years ago when I was doing it? I mean, I would say it was, it's probably at a much higher speed as this point. Um, they're taking in more at all at once and it's moving faster. Um, so it's, I mean, while it's still continuously monitoring it and like everything like that, um, I feel like it's just much larger of a scale and it's become more refined now. What type of companies do you think would be most interested in that uh, continuous auditing? I would consider like uh, companies such as like Walmart, something that is taking in a lot of data on a daily basis. Uh, a lot of places that uh, use um, a basis to uh, like assets big in that and uh, being able to generate revenues with uh, selling those assets, companies that are related within that. So what are the, uh, how would you justify cost versus benefit? Because it all, always comes down to cost versus benefit. You all heard me talk about that in multiple classes now. Um, how do you justify the benefits of data analytics when it's something that's fairly intangible? The benefit is reducing misstatements and misappropriation, which then reduces your costs overall. So it kind of pays for itself in its own way. Any other questions? Next one. All right, one of my favorite sock reporting. <laughs> Don't let me down, guys. <laughs> Pressure's on. We'll say, we'll say, we'll say, if we do let me down, then I'm going to penalize Brett. No, All right. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> on, Brett. Thank you, Brett. All right. So today we're going to be presenting to you about stock reporting. I'm Troy. I'm Jinshu. I'm, I'm Cole. I'm Zhu. I'm Brett. Um, so I'm gonna introduce the SOC report at first. The full name of the SOC report is the System Service and Organizational Controls, and it was produced and developed by the AICPA to assist and report the organizational internal controls and to enhance and ensure the um, trust and transparency. Um, in like how the uh, organizational manage the customer's data, they may focus more on the security, availability, and confidentiality. Um, All right, so taking a look at the history of the SOC reports, they have their initial roots back to the 1970s. This is when the AICPA issued the first statement of auditing standards, or SAS-1. This just kind of covered some fundamental auditing responsibilities, preventing material statement, detecting fraud, things like that. They also have very strong ties to SAS 70 in 1992. This is when the FCPA created a framework for the auditing of internal controls specifically. Um, however, it was not until 2010 that the FCPA gave them their own independent framework, despite the fact that you know, the ideas and concepts have kind of always been in place to some extent, which leads to the purpose of SOC reports. So why did the FCPA feel it was necessary to issue uh, their own private or own separate framework for SOC reports? So the purpose is to verify an organization's compliance with best practices in terms of security, privacy, and internal controls. Um, this is important both internally and externally. So from an auditor's perspective, it's their responsibility to understand and evaluate the effectiveness of internal controls. And for a manager, they're in charge of putting those controls in place, as well as making any necessary corrections. 
Um, and from an external perspective, it's also relevant information for potential investors or business partners. If you think about financial statements, that's very relevant for decision making because if you're looking at investing in a company or maybe going into business with them, if you look at their financials and it looks like they're going to go bankrupt in a year, you're probably not going to want to get involved. Same thing if you're going to look at their stock reports and maybe their internal controls are ineffective, maybe there's privacy and security concerns, kind of the same idea, you're probably going to want to stay away from them. Okay, before we get too far in, does everybody remember what a service organization is? I know it's been a little while since we talked about that. Does everybody kind of remember that still? Yeah, okay. Um, so three different types of SOC reporting. You're going to have SOC 1, SOC 2, or SOC 3. All of these are going to have a different focus or a different use um, or a different audience. Um, as you can remember from a while ago, um, SOC 1 and SOC 2 can also be type 1 or type 2. Um, that'll be explained here in a bit. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with SOC 1 report. And so this is going to be your internal controls over financial reporting. Um, so an auditor, that's what the auditor is going to look at. Um, so anything from a service organization that can affect the user entity's financial reporting. Um, these do have a more limited scope as they're only looking at controls regarding financial reporting. Um, so the users of this are going to be obviously the user organization, um, the auditors, and then the internal management of the service organization. Um, these help establish um, trust between the service organization, the user entity, and then any other uh, possible customers for that service organization. They can prove that their work um, stays clean, their work um, is going to report correctly, uh, that's going to help build their reputation for the future. Um, so there's a couple different goals for SOC reporting, or for SOC ones. Um, the first one, they're going to be, are the controls in place at all? Um, the second goal is going to be, are the controls operating effectively? Because if the control is there, great. But if it's not doing what it's supposed to do, it's not going to be much help. Not going to be much, very much help. Uh, and then lastly, it's going to want to ensure that controls are actually appropriately addressing risks that are relevant to the management assertions given by um, the service organization. Okay, next we're going to talk about SOC 2 report. So these more go into uh, the handling and access of data, uh, like we were talking about earlier. So these are going to look at the implementation and the management of these controls. Um, they're going to help mitigate and identify certain risks for that service organization. They do have its own testing framework, um, which is based on what's called the Trust Services Criteria, abbreviated to TSC, which uh, Brett will talk about here in a minute. Um, so this is really looking for, does the service organization have policies, procedures, and controls in place um, to manage and identify risks based around um, data access? So there's uh, five criteria in a SOC 2. Uh, first off, security, which is must be included, is ensuring that information and in systems are protected from unauthorized access. This is prevented through like two-factor authentication and like intrusion detection systems. Um, next, we have availability. Uh, this ensures that information and systems are available for the use of an entity for their operations. Uh, third up, we have processing integrity. This is just system processing is complete, valid, accurate, and timely. Um, this is helpful for like quality assurance and um, uh, damage control stuff, where like if uh, IT system needs to be reported, uh, repaired. Uh, fourth, we have confidentiality. It's if confidential information is protected and kept private. This is done through like encryption and firewalls. And then privacy is for personal information mostly. Um, it's pretty similar to confidentiality, and it's just keeping. Uh, personal information uh, retained and disposed of by an entity properly. This is also done through the firewall and two-factor authentication. Um, so the types that we have, type one evaluates how well designed um, an entity's policies, processes, and procedures are. Um, it also evaluates how well they've been implemented by an entity. Uh, this type is based on one day um, known as the report date. There's a lot less effort here from the entity and the auditor as it's only based on one day, not over a period of time. So it's usually a lower cost for an entity to have this prepared. And um, there's no evaluation of controls effectiveness in this in a type one report. A type two report is considered an overtime attestation. There's much more information here than a type one that accounts for and evaluates the design and implementation of controls. Um, it tests the controls operating effectiveness over a period of time that is usually three, six, nine, or 12 months, though they're usually at least six months. Um, they're just overall much more thorough than a type one report. 
because they offer um look they just offer like a lot more data to the uh, entity and it's um yeah SOC 3 reports, they're used along with SOC 2, although they're just a much more scaled down version. They're intended for public audiences such as customers and stakeholders. And overall, they just contain a lot less technical information. Um, they uh, do not contain the controls tested for the results or the results from the tests that are being performed because they're just intended to be used for customers and stakeholders. So the SOC report process, first we need to review in the audit scope and <laughs> employ a qualified auditor, develop your project plan, uh, collect relevant documents and prepare for the audit. And the auditor will review and control documents, test the effectiveness of the control, interview relevant personnel, verify the evidence, assess the reliability of the company statement review and solve the issues, identify and document the relevant finding. Read out the report, submit and communicate uh, the report to the client. Uh, and why do soft report matter? Many industries have strong control over data security like financial service, healthcare and data center. And as mentioned earlier, software report can determine compliance with a financial report and SOC2 can determine compliance with security and private standard. This build customer trust and confirmed compliance requirement. It allows the supplier to identify holes with the customer first and fix them, reduce the risk of data leakage and financial reporting areas. Reporting can show that a provider is commitment to high standard of operation and data security, giving the provider a better reputation, uh, a competitive advantage in a highly competitive market. At the same time, the introduction of the different report allows supplier to take target action on different issues. All right, so looking at some future considerations for SOC reporting, to the surprise of nobody, it's going to be heavily influenced by artificial intelligence. Um, and this will be done through something called Autonomous Security Operation Centers. So what this is, is it's artificial intelligence that can detect and correct security threats, but can also make changes to security policy and procedures to prevent that threat from reoccurring in the future. Uh, this is going to be very helpful because it creates more free time for SOC analysts. One of the challenges that they face is just the sheer amount of data and security alerts that they're getting on a nonstop basis. So as a result of that, they don't necessarily have the free time they would like to conduct like thorough and extensive investigations of prior incidents or even predictions and projections in the future. So by you know, offloading some of that workload to the AI, that's going to free up more time for them to focus more on the future and take more of a proactive approach to threat detection where they're trying to predict and respond to those threats rather than reacting once they've actually taken place. And here are some challenges. The first one is adhere to the policy and process constantly. So there are some reasons, maybe like the um poor communication between the teams, or like um there's some policy that may not be reflected to the actual um practice or like the complex procedure that the employees are very stru struggle to follow. And the second one is the efficiency issues, like the time to prepare the SOC reports. So um, if like the companies, uh, organizational companies like underestimate the time they actually required, they may like um, just delay the entire process in the final. And the third one is the proper understanding of the scope. So if the um, company like uh, just focus on the security aspect, they may not like um, they may like overlooking the border um, like commitments like the uh, confidentiality and availability. And the fourth one is the budgeting for the SOC. So like the challenge is that the SOC. Um, organizational company may be like uh, misjudge the full cost of the compliance and thus they can like need to like the incomplete preparations or like the 
um, potential audits um, like failures. And the last one is a balance between the process and technique aspects. So if the um, company rely, like over rely on the tech, uh, technologies, they may like um, without not like um, well-defined process. And this may lead to the misaligned um, control. And But if they rely more on like um, the overdated process, they may hinder the, hinder the effectiveness use of the um, like the modern technology. And so to, oh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, just to overcome these challenges, um, they need like the um, strategic planning, the corporations and the realistic budgeting and to uh, overcome these difficulties and achieve the successful stock um, reports. And thus it, it can like improve the trust and improve the transparency uh, with uh, their clients. And um, so in conclusion, the SOAD reports are essential tools for the organization. They may like ensure the compl compliance and the manage risk and uh, making the external decisions. So um, as the digital and regulatory like evolves, the SOC reports will continue to um, produce and refer some um, um, enhanced framework to overcome and meet this risk and uh, um, technology advancement to ensure the trust and transparency remain like uh, paramount. And that's it, thank you. They mentioned type one versus type two reports. So which of the categories of stock reports we talked about can utilize uh, both types? Both type one and type two? Yeah. Uh, that'll be SS or SOC one and SOC two. SOC three is always type two. Okay. I believe. So what's the difference between SOC two and SOC three? It's just a lot less technical information in that. It's to try to open it up to a more broader audience. Um, so that's going to be, uh, like Brett was talking about earlier, it's going to be, uh, other kinds of customers, so not people that aren't in that industry every day, um, just try to help broaden that scope a little bit. Yeah, it just tends to like not contain controls tested or the results of the controls being tested, so it's just more friendly for like um, not non auditor and like interesting audiences. Both, both cover trust service criteria, but uh, SOC three is more kind of like a general perspective, yeah. whereas uh, SOC two is a uh, more stakeholder perspective. Okay. Um, we touched on this. Are there some dangers to integrating AI uh, AI tools into SOC reporting? You talked about some of the advantages, but I'm curious if there's some if you identified or thought about it, the dangers of doing that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, AI, you know, it has to learn. So I think in the beginning, especially when you're first integrating it, you're kind of running the risk that there's going to be some mistakes. Um, however, I think it's also kind of just like inevitable, especially when we talk about security. Um, People are going to be trying to gain access to information and they're probably going to have AI at their disposal. So they're therefore entities like banks, hospitals, large corporations, like they're going to have to implement it. So I think there will definitely be kind of a learning curve and some difficulties at the beginning, but it's kind of a necessary risk, I would say. Do you see the AI CPA potentially creating uh, special variants on stock reporting, such as if they identify issues like maybe artificial intelligence or cybersecurity or uh, supply chain management, creating special formats for SOC reports? I mean, I would anticipate that for sure. Like, uh, as we kind of touched on in the beginning, how they kind of continuously evolve and they issue new statements of auditing standards kind of as the time changed, or maybe there's a reaction to some kind of scandal or something. So I think as artificial intelligence becomes more prevalent, it's definitely going to be something that they're going to have to issue their own guidelines for. Any questions? Uh, good presentations, guys. Very well done. I guess uh, Group One has got to, got to live up to the presentation uh, standard set today. So uh, yeah, I was very happy with the presentations that were done today. So uh, that does it. Um, we'll be back on Friday for a final presentation, and I'll see you all then.